Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Enhancing Patient Self-Management of Chronic Kidney Disease Using an Electronic Health Tool. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select the audio next to the mute and mute icon on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Select Leave Computer Audio and then select Phone Call and follow the dial in prompt. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Patients with chronic kidney disease need to balance their complex medical condition with the demands of daily life while maintaining emotional well-being. Dr. Brenda Hemelgarn is the research lead of the SPOR Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research, CanSolve CKD Research Product Strategies to Enhance Patient Self-Management of CKD. This research product aims to understand how to empower patients to self-manage their chronic kidney disease to improve disease progression and overall patient experience and well-being. Dr. Hemelgarn will share the findings of the research project and showcase the CKD self-management tool that is being developed as part of the CanSolve CKD study and their patients' partners. The Kidney Foundation of Canada would like to thank our sponsors for providing unrestricted educational grants to make this webinar possible, including Ozuka, Zanzogenzyme, AstraZeneca, and Horizon. The Kidney Foundation of Canada is thrilled to our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Brenda Hemelgarn and Dwight Sparks and Lydia Lauder, the Director of Programs and Public Policy of Kidney Foundation. Brenda Hemelgarn is MD, PhD, Professor, Department of Community Health Sciences and Medicine at the University of Calgary. Dr. Brenda Hemelgarn is a clinician scientist with some specialty training in nephrology. She is professor and head of the Department of Community Health Sciences, where she undertakes her academic activities and maintains a clinical practice in nephrology through the Department of Medicine. Her research interests are in the study of chronic metal conditions, including chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, as well as the knowledge translation strategies to improve care provided to this patient population. She is a recipient of the Roy and Vi Bay Chair in Kidney Research, has over 475 peer-reviewed publications, and has received numerous awards and recognitions, including fellowship in the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. She is also Vice Chair, Board of Directors for Alberta Health Sciences. Dwight Sparks lives in St. John's and works as Senior Application Analyst with Newfoundland and Labrador Centre for Health Information. In 2014, Dwight was diagnosed with chronic tubular encephalitis nephritis caused by drug interaction while undergoing treatment for his vasculitis. Today's Dwight vasculitis is in remission but lives with the effects of chronic kidney disease every day. Dwight joined Cancel CKD as patient partner in 2017 as a way to give back and hopefully be able to contribute to improving the lives of people living with CKD. Currently, Dwight is a patient partner on four research projects, a member of the curriculum and membership committee, patient co-chair of the CNTN building committee, and sits on the CNTN executive committee. And now, over to you, Dr. Hemelgarn. Thank you very much, Tracy. Chronic kidney disease, the whole purpose today is really talk about what we need to know now in order to manage our, our current state, our kidney disease, effectively. And that's the whole purpose of, of this presentation today, is to understand what self-management is and what self-management is for chronic kidney disease. So what Dwight and I are going to do today is we're going to tell you a little bit about our CanSolve project, identify the need, why we even chose to undergo this project to develop a CKD self-management tool, and then to look at what is the current state of CKD self-management tools and supports, what is out there currently, and importantly, what are the gaps out there, because um, it really is the gaps that have helped inform us um, and advise us of how to best develop and co-develop, importantly co-develop, 
the CKD self-management e-health tool as part of our CanSolve project. So there's a couple things I'm going to emphasize. The one thing I'm going to emphasize is that uh, self-management and the tool that we're developing has been co-developed by our patient partners, which is really important when you're developing tools like this. Um, and the other thing I'm going to emphasize is that um, we're nearing completion of the, developing the tool, and at the very end of this um, webinar, we'll actually give you a little snapshot of what the tool is looking like as it's coming together. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background, why we're even doing this in the first place, and then a little snapshot of the tool at the end. So why are we even doing this? Why are we even looking at self-management strategies for patients with chronic kidney disease? This, about five years ago, we undertook a national project called the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership, where we worked with a variety of different partners, patients, um, healthcare professionals, uh, caregivers, and we asked them what were the research priorities for them. These are patients with chronic kidney disease, earlier stages of kidney disease, not yet on dialysis. So we said, what are the important things for you as patients or caregivers or healthcare professionals with chronic kidney disease? What's important for you to know and understand? And one of the top 10 priorities that this group identified, again, this was a national group from across Canada, is they really wanted to know what the best strategies were to help patients manage their chronic kidney disease themselves and to ultimately improve their experiences and their outcomes. And the whole emphasis here is on best strategies for patients and their caregivers to manage their CKD themselves. So knowing that that was one of the priorities, we then took that forward to the, the National Can Solve CKD Network. And I'm sure many of you are either involved with this network, or have heard about this network before. Um, so it's funded by uh, CHR and multiple partners, and it actually allowed us the opportunity to bring this project forward, which was endorsed by our CanSolve network, and we were able to move forward in developing a self-management tool for earlier stages of chronic kidney disease. Importantly, we had patient partners who have worked with us um, even before this project began in, um, on this project specifically. And these are our patient partners here. We've got Blair from Manitoba, uh, Chantel and Claire from, uh, from Alberta, Gwen from British Columbia, Lucy from British Columbia as well, and Dwight, who you're going to hear about later today, uh, from Newfoundland. So these are our partners who've worked with us every step of the way uh, in this project. And in addition to our patient partners, we also have academic and clinical partners uh, from across the country. I'm not going to go through all the individual names of people here, just to say that we've got um, nurses and uh, allied healthcare professionals and nephrologists and primary care physicians uh, from across the country who are, are working on this project. So again, what we're trying to do, the overall aim of this project is to co-develop, so to co-develop with patients and caregivers, a self-management support intervention, and in this instance, it's going to be uh, an e-health or electronic health tool that can be individualized to each individual patient to their unique situation based on what their needs and priorities are, again, to improve their outcomes and to enhance their quality of life. You may have heard about self-management and self-management strategies before, and that really is uh, the, the foundation of this work. Self-management is probably best understood um, in nursing philosophy. It's a, a holistic aspect of care. And when we speak about self-management, what we're referring to is the ability of the individuals, so the individuals who have um, the, the condition of interest, in conjunction with their family and their community and their healthcare professionals. So again, this is multifaceted. It's not just one individual looking at a broad aspect of care. It's everything from managing symptoms to the medical management to the lifestyle changes and also, importantly, to things like the social, social, psychosocial, cultural, and spiritual consequences of living with chronic conditions. 
So it is, it's multifaceted, it's um, involving patients and caregivers and healthcare professionals and individuals in the community as well, all working together to support the patient in managing symptoms and managing the medical conditions as well as the cultural and spiritual consequences. So when we speak about self-management, that's really what we're referring to. It's not just how do you take this drug or how do you take your blood pressure. It's about managing uh, the individual uh, in conjunction with um, others around them as well. And there's been various self-management tools developed for different conditions. Um, cancer is probably one that's got a variety of them. But what we really wanted to focus is on is how can we develop self-management tools for patients with earlier stages of chronic kidney disease. So when we started this project, we said we're going to do things in phases. We're going to do this um, in, a, in an organized fashion. And the first thing that we wanted to do was identify what's out there already. What do we know that's existing in the literature or that's being utilized now uh, with respect to self-management strategies for patients with chronic kidney disease? Because if there's some really good things out there already, we can just modify those and use those. So that was the very first thing we did. Then we went on to, uh, I did, to speak to patients and caregivers with chronic kidney disease across the country to have a better understanding of what they wanted in a self-management tool. And finally, phase three is where we are now in co-developing and then going to pilot test electronic health tool. So that's an overview of our entire project. And what I'm going to speak about today, Dwight and I are going to speak about, is these various phases that we've gone through. So the first phase was to do what we call um, a scoping review of the literature to see what is out there, what's existing, what is current practice like with respect to self-management of chronic kidney disease. And so we looked at the literature. In fact, there was over 16,000 abstracts that we reviewed and 50 articles that, we, um, that met our criteria that we looked at in depth to, that described self-management interventions for adults with chronic kidney disease. And when we summarize all that information, so after reading 16,000 abstracts and pulling 50 papers, this is what we found with respect to chronic kidney disease specifically. There actually isn't a lot of information on two of the things the patients have told us are important, and that's symptom management and lifestyle. There wasn't a lot of information at all there. A lot of the information or a lot of the strategies didn't use technology as a mode of delivery. There was a lot that had um, hard copy or paper materials, um, but nothing that was more electronic. And they really didn't look at the sustainability of the informa information or interventions. And, and looking at them, they actually were quite limited because of resources and, and costs associated with them. And the one thing that was loud and clear was that these tools were developed without patient involvement in their development. There would be a researcher or a healthcare professional that would develop the tool. And there was less than 1% that actually had patients involved in identifying what was important to them in these self-management interventions. So when we reviewed all the literature, we said, well, you know, there really isn't anything out there that we can modify. Um, we, we're going to have to start from scratch, um, and especially engaging and asking the patients and their caregivers what they want in a self-management tool. So w we knew that we were going to have to see what was existing currently by talking to our patients. And we also thought that another potential way of knowing what's out there was to survey the CKD clinics. So we thought, well, maybe they're using tools in the various clinics across the country, but they haven't published them. Maybe they're not published in the literature. And so what we did is we surveyed um, the chronic kidney disease clinics. So these are the multidisciplinary clinics from across the country. There are 57 of them that we contacted, uh, and 44 of those from across Canada that actually responded to our survey. And we asked them about the various types of tools that they used, um, what did they focus on in terms of information, 
How did they provide the information? Was it in a written format or was it in a small group format? We really wanted to understand what, what was available and being used in these multidisciplinary clinics. So what we found from the clinics was, again, as we saw in the literature, information on emotional support and symptom management, again, was really limited. And especially for earlier stages of chronic kidney disease, a lot of these multidisciplinary clinics focus on patients with later stages of kidney disease. Um, and so a lot of the information was based on things like modality selection, what's the best type of dialysis, for example. And so the things like emotional support or symptom management was limited. The primary way that they delivered the information was either in person when a patient would come for a clinic visit, for example, or else written material. So again, electronic or something that patients could access from home was not available. And there was also minimal information that was specific for caregivers, for other individuals, for spouses, for example, or for sons and daughters um, that are looking after or caring for patients with chronic kidney disease. There's minimal information there. And finally, we found that there was a lack of tailored resources for patients' needs. And that, again, is for patients with earlier stages of chronic kidney disease. We know that actually 90% of patients with earlier stages of chronic kidney disease are managed in primary care settings. And as nephrologists or in multidisciplinary care clinics, we see a much smaller proportion proportion of patients with more advanced kidney disease and more severe kidney disease. And so there was a, a whole um, gap of information that was missing for patients with earlier stages. So we knew there wasn't anything in the literature. Uh, we know that they're using a lot of things in the various clinics, but they're focused on patients with more advanced chronic kidney disease. So then we said, okay, we're going to have to talk to patients with earlier stages of kidney disease and their family members from across the country and ask them what's important to them, what information would be important for them in managing chronic kidney disease, what would they like to know. And so what we did in this phase was conducted focus groups and that just means bringing, bringing groups of uh, patients and caregivers together in various settings and asking them those very various questions and then um, theming that information and developing themes and really understanding um, what the needs of these adults with chronic kidney disease is regarding their self-management support. And so we did this across the country. This is actually an example of one of the focus groups in London, Ontario, um, where they were discussing uh, support needs. We also did phone interviews with some individuals that weren't able to come into the small group settings. Um, and Mo Donald led this work and just did a fantastic job of summarizing all that information uh, together. And so what did we find from that information? Well, that was the richest and um, most informative type of information that we got when we asked the patients and their caregivers, what, what's important to you? What matters to you? In how, and how can we support you in self-managing your chronic kidney disease? And this is actually, this figure was drawn by our patient partners um, and they felt that this best depicted the information um, that was important to them. They described living with chronic kidney disease as living on a roller coaster. They said that there was lots of ups and downs um, in the disease and the disease process. And they felt that the most important was the person in the driver's seat, and that's the patient or the caregiver. And you can see that in the individual um, at the top of the, at the car there, living well with chronic kidney disease. They spoke a lot about living well with the kidney disease, and that was what their focus was on. They talked, you can see the struts. Um, there was two important um, structural components that were important to support them. There was the tangible or the practical support, and there was the CKD information sharing. So those are the pillars there that were important for, for, um, for supporting them. And then you'll see in the cars behind the driver, there's actually eight what we call buckets of information. So what we heard from um, the patients and from their caregivers that there's actually eight key components of information that they felt were important to help them self-manage their chronic kidney disease. The first was awareness and understanding, so understanding what chronic kidney disease is and, and how it develops and how to manage it. 
There was lots of questions about finances related to uh, management of the disease or in general if they're not able to work. They felt that there was lots of information they wanted on medications and alternative treatments, what they should take and what they should avoid. And then there was lots of questions that they had about symptoms, what symptoms to expect, how can we manage these symptoms, um, what is a serious symptom that I should seek medical attention for. There was lots of questions as well about work and education, maybe modifying the work schedule, can they continue with their education, for example. Lots of questions about travel, is it okay to travel, what are the considerations I should have when I travel. So lots of questions about travel and a lot of questions about diet. Um, what's an appropriate diet? What can I eat? What shouldn't I eat? Um, what should I avoid? How can I slow progression by my diet? And then there was also lots of questions about mental and physical health, um, about questions about feeling depressed, questions about what types of physical activity they could do or shouldn't do. So overall, after all those interviews and focus groups, we had a good understanding from our, our patient partner, from our patients across the country, what they felt is going to be important in self-management. So again, it's a roller coaster, and then eight big buckets of information. So actually quite a bit that we knew that we would potentially need to address in developing a self-management tool. And I just want to give you a few quotes that we heard um, during these focus groups and interviews because it really gives you an idea of what um, the patients and their caregivers are experiencing. So this is one quote. Uh, one of the patients says, she, the doctor, gives me this booklet to read, and I sat there about two minutes into it, and I couldn't stop crying. I was thinking he, and that was her husband, was going to die, that this was going to happen, that was going to happen. So you can hear the, the angst um, in this caregiver, again, hearing this diagnosis for the first time. And this is a, a quote that we heard quite a bit, actually, from patients. It says, you can tell somebody what they can't eat, but then when you don't provide them with alternatives, you kind of get stuck. And we heard this from a variety of different patients. They said they keep telling us what we can't eat, but really what we want to know is what we can eat. So tell us what we can eat. So being more optimistic and positive about the things that can be done. And finally, we heard from a patient that said it affected my life tremendously, especially when I was first diagnosed. Before that, I didn't have any idea nor inclination that I was sick. And again, this speaks to the silent nature of chronic kidney disease, that usually you don't develop symptoms until the condition is quite late. And so this is what this patient was experiencing, didn't have symptoms and then um, received this diagnosis and really didn't have any idea or inclination that they were sick. So again, speaking to the fact of the knowledge and the understanding and the awareness of chronic kidney disease is important for them. So what we did after that, so we knew um, the, the eight big buckets of information that our patients and caregivers felt was important in developing and incorporating into this e-health tool but that was a lot of information. So then we said, well, how are we going to prioritize what we're going to use? What's going to be important? Uh, and what are the features of this tool that are going to be important? So that's when do we develop something called a consensus workshop, where again, we brought together um, patients and caregivers and healthcare providers and healthcare professionals to really determine and prioritize the content and the feature preferences for this e-health tool. I'm going to hand over to Dwight now, who's going to give us his perspective on this and, and give you some of the information um, about the consensus workshop. So Dwight, it's over to you. Thanks, Brenda. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and the struggles of, uh, that I had getting the information that I needed to uh, successfully manage my disease. I'm also going to mention uh, the work that the uh, patient partners have done on this uh, project. Um, I, I remember the day that my nephrologist told me that I had uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, he told me uh, not to eat salt and basically sent, sent me on my way. Um, he might have said more. I don't really rem I remember anything else. My head was just like swimming with... Um, 
well, what am I going to do? Uh, I really didn't have a frame of reference for the disease itself. I didn't know anyone, uh, no friends or family were diagnosed with it. So I was really lost and my wife felt the same way. We were really confused um, about where to go from, from here. Um, of course, the, your first thought is go on the internet. And uh, I found that uh, <clears throat> there was a lot there, like so much, but it was often conflicting and um, some things were just plain wrong. <clears throat> but I got through it. Um, I, I, when I was first diagnosed, my function was down in the low 30s and I was after several years, able to get it up into the high 40s. And that's where I am now. I kind of fluctuate between uh, anywhere from 42 to 48% uh, percent with my function. Um, so when I, when I joined the uh, project in, uh, May, in um, May of 2017, I was pretty excited. I wanted... Self-management, I felt, was something that I knew something about. Um, the research team was just in a process of finishing up the scoping review of phase one that Brenda has already mentioned. And it was on to phase two. And this is where the patients, the patient partners, really got down to work. Um, since I live in New, New, Newfoundland, uh, I couldn't uh, be part of a focus group, so I had to give my story during a a phone interview, but that that was fine. Um, once the focus groups and the uh, phone interviews were completed, the research team began compiling and summarizing the data into several overarching themes, as you saw. Uh, the next step was a, the workshop, and this is what I'm going to talk, talk about, to analyze uh, the data and come up with content and features. Um, but before the workshop though, we had to develop uh, patient partners and that's the, the next thing I'm gonna mention. Um, so personas, one of the, the patient's partners activities included a new approach where our patient partners were instrumental in creating three patient and three caregiver personas. Our persona, is a fictitious description of a person, like a person's profile that includes who they are, what motivates them, and what issues they face. In our work, the personas each demonstrate the life complexities that patients and caregivers have to deal with. For example, go-getter Grace has a family. She works and is physically active. Her challenges are managing her home her work life and maintaining her multiple roles in her life. The, the personas were an effective tool to advocate for patients and caregivers who could not directly be involved in determining the preferences for the CKD self-management tool. As well, they helped facilitate discussion between the workshop participants. Next slide, please. Next slide. Here we go, perfect. Um, the co-creation of the personas uh, was a multi-step process where the patient partners were greatly involved. Starting with a template for each one, then having pa uh, patient partners add some conceptual concepts sorry, contextual uh, concepts, uh, for example, uh, what mo motivates this persona? What were the challenges? Mo mo modifications were made to the personas based on the patient partner in input. Draft personas <clears throat> were presented to our CANSOLVE CKD research team and final personas were agreed upon. Uh, these final personas 
were used in our uh, one day consensus workshop in Cal Calgary last year. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of a uh, patient participant at the workshop standing with Mo. The participants were asked to put themselves in their persona's shoes to identify content and features for an e-health uh, CKD self-management tool. This uh, patient participant is presenting his group's suggestions for content for the uh, e-health tool. Personas have a great potential to be used in other POR projects. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a picture of the uh, workshop participants. Uh, we had many uh, various stakeholders, which included 11 patients, uh, six caregivers, uh, and uh, many more people for, with, with different roles from across Canada. As you can see by the number of patients uh, and caregivers, uh, outnumbered the other clinical participants. This was important based on the goal of the workshop, identifying the preferences for the key players. Next slide. Oh, there, there's the rest of the roles, the rest of the clinicians and roles. Next slide. And this is our uh, CANSOL team. As you see, this is probably, I would say the only picture where I'm actually in the front row. I'm not sure why I am, but uh, this is the uh, uh, the patient partners involved in the workshop. And I'm going to hand it back to Brenda, who will talk about the findings from this workshop. Thank you, Dwight. So from that workshop, we were actually able to identify from those eight buckets that you will recall from that roller coaster. We then went back to um, after the workshop and were able to um, then identify the specifics in terms of the content preferences. Next slide. So within each of those eight buckets, we had um, prioritized the information. So in understanding CKD, uh, the patients and the individuals at the workshop felt that there were some things that were particularly important in understanding the role of the kidneys, getting information about CKD in general, and really understanding about d disease progression, what to expect um, with respect to the progression of the disease and how to slow that progression in particular. There was lots of questions about diet um, and we heard loud and clear at the workshop that they wanted reliable kidney diet information and they wanted to know what foods were, they referred to them as kidney friendly. Again, what foods could they eat as opposed to always focusing on kidneys or food that they can't eat. Finance focused on two major areas with respect to finances, there was the affordability of medication and food, recognizing that alterations in diet may also come with financial consequences, and that being on some of the required medications may also have financial implications. And then they also felt it was important to, for self-management to be able to develop a resource and, and planning with respect to, to financing, recognizing that living with chronic kidney disease would undertake a number of, of years and so planning and, and financial planning was going to be important. Medications was another one of those buckets and there was lots that the patients and caregivers wanted to know. They wanted to know what are the most common medications that patients with chronic kidney disease will use, what are their side effects and why would they be used, and then what about the cost and coverage for these medications. Next slide. And then the final four buckets um, with respect to symptoms. Again, the patients wanted to know what symptoms can they expect, and especially as the disease progresses, 
what is normal or what when um, should they be expecting certain types of symptoms and then lots of questions about how to manage the symptoms what can they do themselves again reflecting the self-management and when should they seek medical attention regarding the symptoms lots of information about mental and physical health as well lots of discussion about depression and how common depression can be in chronic disease states and in chronic kidney disease so wanted to know if there were screening for depression tools that would be available and what sorts of supports could then be recommended also recognize the importance of cultural sensitivity with respect to this information and all related information and again reflecting the, the mental wellness aspect it was about adjusting to what they referred to as a new normal, a new way of, of life, a new way of living in living with chronic kidney disease, living well with chronic kidney disease. The work in education bucket had a couple of, of major focuses, and most of it related to how to support the integration of living with a chronic condition into the work environment for those who are working, um, as well as into the school and, and education environment for those who were still going to school, could there potentially be some restrictions or could there be modifications of duties or what could actually help to facilitate them in these two um, areas. And finally, travel was another one of those buckets that was very important for the patients and caregivers. They wanted more information about is there limitations to travel? What about insurance? Do I need to get insurance or special types of insurance? What are the considerations if I'm going to some remote locations? How do I access health care if something happens when, when, I'm, when I'm there? And some basic things like even a travel checklist. What, should, what are the important things for me to consider if I'm traveling so that I know I have addressed um, all of these issues? Next slide. So those were the eight buckets of information. So through that consensus workshop, we were able to prioritize the information that would be important to incorporate into that e-health tool. And then we also had another section, as Dwight mentioned, about what were the preferences for this tool that patients wanted. And they spoke about a lot of different things. They wanted lots of pictures and lots of vid visuals, not just a lot of text, they felt that a lot of the websites that were available currently were very text heavy and you had to read a lot. They wanted more visuals and pictures. They wanted the ability to enter and track health information that was important for them. They wanted information that they could access on the go. If they were in a grocery store, for example, and wanted to know about a certain type of food, they'd be able to access that information. And they also wanted links to resources. They wanted some quick information that they could access on the go, but they also wanted to be able to have the opportunity to read more in depth about certain aspects of well, as well. They wanted, if possible, the opportunity to interact virtually with the health team. They felt that that was a high priority. And they also wanted or expressed a desire to have access to electronic personal health records, to their own health records. So some of these abilities are going to be limited um, depending on where the patients are and what's available to them in the various provinces um, across Canada. But these, in general, were the, the feature preferences that the patients and caregivers felt uh, were most important. Next slide. So what we're doing now is we're taking all that information and along with our patient partners um, and our web designer team are co-developing this electronic health tool and then we'll begin pilot testing it. So what I'm going to do now is show you a little bit more about how we've developed it and what's available currently. So next slide. So the important things in this tool is that we're using Canadian context. We're using information that's um, based and derived in Canada, and, and we want to be consistent um, with the information that's out there, such as from the Kidney Foundation of Canada. And again, we've looked at the website and eScan findings to support this information. We're using experts, our patient partners, and our clinicians um, across the country in developing it to make sure that we have credible, reliable information. And finally, 
we're doing this in an iterative process. We've got um, dietitians, for example, from across the country that we've sent information to, social workers from across the country that have contributed to the development of this. So we really want to make sure that it's reflecting um, accurate, incredible information um, that's relevant in Canada. And next slide. And this is just a little snapshot of one of the pages. So our website is called My Kidneys, My Health, and the whole focus is living well with chronic kidney disease. We heard that again and again from our patient partners. They wanted to live well with chronic kidney disease. And again, that speaks to the whole self-management strategy and the importance of um, managing and living with this disease condition themselves. So everyone's journey is different. And if you're living with chronic kidney disease or caring for someone, there's going to be information on this website that will help um, them to, to self-manage the chronic kidney disease. So you, on this page, you'll see some of those eight buckets. Um, you can click on these various links. And what we've done is we've integrated written information um, along with videos. We've got videos that have little snapshots of information to tell us some more about diet or medications or symptoms, for example. There's the written information, as I said, and there's also the opportunity um, to ask questions. There's some questions there that you can um, check off or add to and print off um, questions to take to your healthcare providers at your next visit as you're reading this information and maybe want to understand something in greater depth or detail. So this is just one of the general pages that has um, part of those eight buckets of information. A next page. We worked really hard on diet. Um, we heard a lot from our patient partners and caregivers, a lot of questions about diet, and they really wanted to have one place where they could come to and find out about foods that had the nutrient content um, that was appropriate for them. So we focused on the different common foods and then incorporating the sodium content, the potassium content, and the phosphorus content. So that this page gives you a little bit of an idea about what the diet page will look like. So you can actually search for categories of foods or you can search for a certain type of food and it will tell you whether it's low or moderate or high in one of those nutrient contents. You can also print off foods that are just low in potassium if that's what you're interested in or foods that are low in sodium. So you can kind of mix and match as well. Uh, next page. And this just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of some of the things. So if you would have picked fruits, for example, um, it would give you here apples or dried apples or apricots. It gives you the serving size, and then it tells you the nutrient content. And at the, at the bottom, there's a little checkbox that says, add to my food list. If you want to keep these sorts of foods on a food list of your own, you can do that. You can customize uh, your own food list. Next page. So that gives you a bit of an idea about what the stat, we call it static content is like. So lots of interactive types of information about each of those eight buckets. And there's also for each of those eight buckets, a little video scripts which we've incorporated to give you um, audio and visual information um, that the patients have also required. And I'm gonna give you a li one little example of, of that. It's a three minute video that talks about what your kidneys do. I hope it works okay. Um, you're gonna have to turn up your computer speakers. The audio was a little low when we were testing it, but I hope it works okay. If the audio doesn't work, not to worry, you can also see the visuals. We're doing closed caption as well, so there will be um, the closed caption uh, in when the version goes live, but I just wanna give you an idea of what um, one of the videos looks like. So we'll try that video now. What do your kidneys do? Most people have two kidneys. Your kidneys are about the size of your fist and are shaped like kidney beans. They're located in your lower back under your rib cage. Your kidneys are the hardest working organs in your body with many important jobs, including cleaning your blood by removing waste products, regulating salt and water in your body, helping keep your red blood cell counts normal, regulating your blood pressure by producing hormones, keeping your bones healthy and strong, and balancing your body's minerals, including phosphate and potassium. So how do your kidneys work? 
First, blood enters your kidneys through a main vessel called the renal artery. Each kidney contains many tiny filtering units called nephrons. Inside each nephron is a strainer called a glomerulus that cleans the blood. From here, the clean blood is sent back to your body. Urine is made with a waste and the extra fluid your body does not need and travels to the bladder through a tube called the ureter. If your kidneys are not working well, this can cause a buildup of fluids and waste, high blood pressure, and anemia, which is a low number of red blood cells. What is chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease, or CKD, means that your kidneys are not working as they should and it covers a range of conditions that may result in long-term kidney damage. One in 10 Canadians has some form of kidney disease. For many people, CKD will develop slowly over time without any symptoms. That's why chronic kidney disease may not be detected until your kidneys are no longer functioning well. Early diagnosis and treatment may slow down or stop progression. Active involvement in managing your chronic kidney disease such as making dietary changes, keeping active, and taking prescribed medications is key to slowing down the disease. If your chronic kidney disease keeps getting worse, it may lead to kidney failure. This will require a kidney transplant, dialysis, or other options for cleaning blood and regulating fluid in your body. What causes Chronic kidney disease typically develops over time and is less likely to be present at birth. Two of the most common causes of chronic kidney disease are diabetes and high blood pressure. Other causes include heart disease, immune diseases, and family history of kidney disease. Are you at risk? Take the Kidney Foundation of Canada quiz at www.kidney.ca slash risk to find out if you should talk to your doctor about having your kidney function checked. To learn more about living well with chronic kidney disease, explore our website. So that gives you a little bit of an idea about the video content that we're gonna be incorporating as well. I hope you were able to hear it. If not, don't worry. Um, it's still in development. At least you saw some of the visuals and, and what that's going to look like. Again, we want it to be multifaceted in how we were providing this information. So to summarize now, the key messages from this presentation, again, the, the importance of having patients and caregivers identify the need for this self-management strategy for earlier stages of chronic kidney disease. That's what we heard loud and clear. We also were aware that the supports and resources that are available currently were tailored to the individual needs and preferences to the same way as what our, our patient partners had really um, felt was best. And really another key message from this is just the importance of having a person-centered care um, by, by engaging the patients and caregivers and co-developing and testing this eHealth tool. The tool is for them. It's for them to help them self-manage their chronic kidney disease, so it's so important to have them uh, involved in, in the co-development of it. And then finally, the importance of having a national stakeholder input throughout the project phases. We've had patient partners from across the country. We've had um, clinicians and healthcare professionals, allied healthcare professionals um, from across the country. And we've had a huge team that's been working on this. Um, want to recognize and, and thank those as well who've worked so hard um, in putting this together. So I just want to thank um, the individuals and remind you again of the phases. So phase one, the, the literature review, phase two, where we actually had the interviews with patients and caregivers, phase three, where we are right now, the co-developing. And then the next chapter is um, phase four, which is going to be the implementation and evaluation of this tool. And that's just where we're at um, now, just finishing off the development and then uh, going to launch. So with the next slide, a huge thank you to CanSolve, to the CKD network, um, and to our research team, um, in particular to Mo Donald, um, Sarah Gill, and Michelle Smickle, who've worked tirelessly here locally and everyone across the country who's contributed, dietitians and social workers, um, and nephrologists and nurses, pharmacists, who've all uh, contributed greatly. 
So a huge thank you uh, to everyone. And thank you for your, your time and attention and look forward to, to your questions. And a great thank you to Dwight for all his input and his great input here today as well. Thank you, Dr. Hemmelgarn and Dwight. Um, we're now going to begin answering questions that have been asked for today. And just a reminder, you can type your questions into the questions box. Our first question is for uh, Dr. Hemmelgarn. Why did you decide to focus on the pre-dialysis CKD population and not dialysis patient, given their heavy burden on self-management responsibilities? That's a great question. So we, we elected to focus on the earlier stages of chronic kidney disease because when we were talking to our patients, they really felt that there was a lack of information at those earlier stages. These are the patients, as I mentioned before, who are going to be managed in primary care in the community-based settings and are less likely to be seen in multidisciplinary care clinics. And so they really wanted to be able to access the information to help them in earlier stages um, to understand what medications to take, the diet, uh, the symptoms, so to be able to access that information readily. We do recognize and appreciate that patients with later stages and patients on dialysis in particular have a high symptom burden. There are some tools that are available out there, and in fact, some of the information that's on this uh, tool will also be relevant for patients um, already on dialysis. Um, but we, in particular, wanted to focus in that area where that big gap was, where there's a lack of information for patients with earlier stages. So help them to self-manage, their disease condition and ultimately uh, to slow the progression and improve the outcomes and quality of life. Thank you, Dr. Hemmelgarn. Our next question is for Dwight. Dwight, why did you decide to join the self-management project? Uh, well, when I joined uh, CanSolve in, in uh, May of 2017, um, I had a choice of 18 projects and I guess the question was asked to me like what are you interested in so I just kind of scanned across the list and again like a lot of the uh, projects dealt with dialysis and transplant and uh, when I came to this this one the name just kind of popped because as I said before uh, yeah I guess I live with this each day and um, if I know anything, it's a little bit about uh, self-management because the work, like, it really is, as Brenda mentioned, uh, uh, you know, you work as a team with your uh, your doctor and and your your wife, your your spouse, um, but you know, it's all about, um, I guess. Uh, Trying to live, um, trying to live the best life you can with the disease you, you have, and um, so that's what I came came down to. I thought that it just made sense, really. Thank you, Dwight, for that. Uh, our next question, I think, is for Dr. Hemmelburn. Uh There's a few coming out like this, so I'm going to uh, just read them out loud. Uh, the website, is it up? Is it running now? When do you think it'll be available? What's the URL for the website? Are you able to give us any of that right now? Hmm. So we're just at the final stages. In fact, we have another meeting tomorrow with um, the web designer where we're going over some of the quality controls. We've been doing lots of testing lately because when we, we want to make sure that when we launch, it's functioning properly, um, that all the links work. So we're just doing those testing phases um, and revising those final stages now. We have to do a little bit of internal testing too in terms of um, the information to make sure that the information that we're providing actually does make a difference. So we're doing a little bit of internal testing. So it'll be in the new year that we anticipate that um, it will be available. The, the website is called My Kidneys, My Health. Um, so when it is available, when you go to that, you'll be able to, to access it. We want to make sure, though, we've spent a lot of time already on this. So we just want to take enough time at this phase to make sure that everything is really um, optimal and, and ready to launch when we do launch it. Thank you, Doctor. Our next question. Uh, we have, Retta is wondering if this will build on the Kidney Foundation book 
units on early CKD management, but in a digital form. So we're actually working now with the Kidney Foundation to see um, how we can uh, integrate and utilize both platforms in the best manner and method possible. We've worked very hard to be sure that we were consistent in terms of the information that's being provided. And so the information from the Kidney Foundation is consistent. We've got several links to various aspects of um, information from the Kidney Foundation, such as the, um, the risk equation, for example. So we've really been working um, closely with them to ensure consistent information. We really, we want to provide options for, our, for patients and caregivers too, so that they can get different sources and different types of information from different sites. And so I think we really can be complementary in terms of um, what we do with the Kidney Foundation and, and what this sites provide. And again, we've been working very closely with them and have another teleconference next week to discuss it in, in greater detail. Thank you, Dr. Hemelgarn. Our next question, how did you seek out and secure early stage CKD patients for the focus groups? Hmm. So we used a variety of different methods in order to um, identify patients with earlier stages of kidney disease who might be interested in participating in the focus groups and in the individual interviews. We used a variety of different methods um, Social media, for example, the Kidney Foundation um, sent out Twitters. Um, we posted on Facebook. We posted um, different tweets. We posted information in some primary clinic offices, in some multidisciplinary care clinic offices, sent out notices. So we really tried to be broad. And we did have representation from across the country, and we we're very pleased to have that. Recognizing, though, that we're not able to get um, all sorts of individuals, people who volunteer to do focus groups and interviews um, tend to be a bit different than, um, than some other groups of individuals. So, for example, um, they're more likely to be um, better educated, to be Caucasian. So we, we weren't able, we, we did have um, some Indigenous patients as well who participated, but there's other groups. That, um, that we weren't able to have the same degree of participation that we may have liked. And so that's one of the limitations of doing work like this. Um, and in the future, what we'd like to do is really focus on, we, I spoke about the importance of spiritual and cultural aspects, so incorporating more of the, the cultural component to the tool. Thank you. And our next question, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, just to type your questions into the questions box for either of our speakers today. Dwight, this is for you. What has been your role or your responsibilities on the self-management project? Um, well, I've, um, I've had a variety of roles, really. Um, initially, I was a, re a research participant um, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was a, a research participant initially, and then uh, I was also uh, involved in the consensus workshop. So that involved um, pretty much trying to come up with the features for the um, uh, for the e-health tool. Um, I've been involved actually. I was part. I was doing uh, some some testing. Uh, of the, um, the, the beta version of the e-health tool. So, um, and <clears throat> a lot of times whenever, uh, whatever, the way Brenda uh, and Mo, the way they ran the, uh, the project, anything that could, that the patients could do, uh, they did. Uh, they really uh, reached out and, and sought our advice as much as possible. Um, I really see them as uh, not like, um, as kind of, we really were partners in the development of this e-health tool. Thank you so much, Dwight. Our next question, Dr. Hemelgun, is does this mean the program will be more appropriate for a CKD one to three? Um, by program, I'm assuming that they mean the e-health tool. 
Um, and that's exactly correct. What we're really focusing on is the earlier stages of chronic kidney disease. We do have some information for um, some of the later stages. For example, symptoms. We talk about symptoms across the various stages. So for patients with, with more advanced CKD, the symptoms that they may be experiencing are there. Um, so the focus is on information, but it can actually be applied to patients across all stages of CKD. Thank you, Doctor. Our next question uh, for you as well. Why did you decide to build an online e-health tool to guide patients in their self-management of CKD? Yeah, so when we decided to do an e-health tool, what we wanted to do is try at this stage to have um, the broadest reach that we could in terms of providing the information. We heard from our patient partners that they wanted information that was uh, readily accessible, accessible on the go, um, that they could have their cell phone, for example, and find the information if they're in a grocery store, or that if they wanted to, they could look at in greater inf detail at home. We recognize that um, there is a proportion of the population that might not have a, a computer or be comfortable accessing an online tool. And so we've actually got a list of future projects and how we might disseminate this type of information more broadly. But recognizing, and we believe, read from the literature that about 60% are so of even uh, the older adult population uh, regularly uses electronic health tools and information. We felt that as a first step, this would be a good we means of disseminating this type of information most broadly. Thank you, doctor. Our next question, fatigue is a common and difficult symptom. Was energy management considered as a self-management tool? So, absolutely correct. So fatigue is a very common symptom, especially in patients with more um, advanced kidney disease. And so for the various symptoms, what we have is um, what to expect by various stages and then how to manage. We have commented about um, management strategies. Um, and then there's resources for additional more in-depth types of tools. Um, but that is another great area that could be focused on uh, in the future, recognizing again the importance and the, and the commonness of fatigue as a symptom in more advanced stages. Thank you. Our next question, uh, Dr. Hemmelgarn is, how will the website information be kept current and up to date after the launch? Uh, many, many websites can become stale or out of date, which can be frustrating, similar to the, book, uh, the booklets and manuals. Are you able to discuss that at this time? Absolutely, that's a very good question and it's something that's so important. I should mention that what we did when we were developing this tool is we also did an environmental scan of existing electronic tools where we went online and uh, used a broad search strategy and found all the online tools that were out there already. And there are certain standards that have been developed that tells you what's a good website and what's a credible website. And one of those standards is just being very explicit and clear about how you're going to update the website where the sources of information are, and then having things like dates to say when it was last reviewed and updated. So we will have a plan in place to ensure that the information and content is kept um, up to date and current. And if there are changes to things, then um, we'll also ensure through our research team that that information is kept current and update. And that's one thing about electronic health tool, it's easier actually to do it in electronic health tool to update the information than it is in printed tools like a booklet because you have to reprint the entire booklet and then disseminate them all. Whereas in electronic health tools, you can go online and, and update um, the various information as required. But it's an important feature and it's something I would encourage anyone who's using an e-health tool to take a look at how the tools were developed, where the information is from and, um, and when they were last updated and what's the process for updating. Thank you, Dr. Hemmelgarn. Um, at this time, we've answered all the questions. I would like to thank both of our speakers, but if anyone does have any more questions, please type them into the questions box. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to introduce Leah Lauder uh, for some closing comments and some Kidney Foundation of Canada update and information. Lydia? 
Thank you very much, Tracy, and a big thank you to Dr. Hemelgarn and Dwight for presenting today. Um, it's been a very interactive and uh, very informative webinar. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to take a few moments just to speak a little bit about the Kidney Foundation of Canada and uh, what we are committed to achieving, uh, which is excellent kidney health and optimal quality of life and a cure for kidney disease. We do this by funding and stimulating innovative research for better treatments and a cure providing education and support to prevent kidney disease in those at risk and empower those with kidney disease to optimize their health status, advocate for improved access to high quality healthcare, and are committed to increasing public awareness and commitment to advancing kidney health and organ donation. The foundation is also committed to providing information and educational resources about kidneys and kidney disease. Um, as Brenda and Dwight mentioned, even with all the resources available through hospitals and kidney care teams, patients can find themselves overwhelmed by the information and it can be difficult to find the answers to all their questions and issues they may be facing. Through our regional branch offices, we offer advice and support about accessing services within the healthcare system, assisting people to access other support from their community and offering assistance and skills for self-advocacy. We invite you to connect with us if you have any further questions, to speak to someone in your community or to access further educational materials and resources. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lydia. And we just received an, another question. So Dr. Hemelgarn, I'll just put you back on the spot if that's okay. Uh, Greg is asking, at what point in the CKD journey do you expect patients to be exposed to this tool? And how would that happen? So actually the, the tool is for uh, any part of their journey. And I expect that patients might use it differently. Somebody with a new diagnosis, for example, might go online and take a look at certain aspects of the information, understanding more about chronic kidney disease, for example, what the kidneys do. Somebody who is at a different stage and might be needing to modify their diet, for example, might focus more on the dietary aspects. So we've tried to, to make this um, useful and informative for patients at any stage throughout their journey with chronic kidney disease. They might use the tool a bit differently at different stages, um, but we'd really strongly encourage them to come back um, and, and explore the, the different aspects of the tools. There's a lot of resources and links that we've included too, and as they're going through their journey, some of those might be more or less relevant uh, to them at various stages. Thank you, Doctor. And we would like to thank both you, Dr. Hemburn and Dwight Sparks for your participation today, as well as thanking everyone for attending today's webinar on self-management. At this time, we have no more questions. And so once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. And we'd appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. And on behalf of the Kidney Foundation of Canada and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of the day.